UVA community. Good morning, President Ryan and Provost McGill. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, come to you from my little house in the Belvedere community of Charlottesville. Uh, Erica and I and my family, we haven't been part of the Virginia community for long. We've been here, this is our second year. I regret to say that most of our time here has been in pandemic, but pre-pandemic, it was a, a lovely time. And I look forward to the day where we properly meet on campus, not worrying about unstable internet, so on and so forth. Uh, I have a presentation that I wish to give, and uh, I'm a little bit nervous about this. As you can expect, I don't ordinarily give lectures like this. And so uh, please bear with me. And if, and I hope you find what I have to say quite interesting. I'd like to echo all of the comments and the correct congratulations for my fellow colleagues who, who do great work. Um, I think one message that I would like to get across that maybe I missed, maybe I'll be the first to mention it, is that one of the great things about being a researcher, one of the great things about being a part of a university community is that it invites us to be like children again. If you remember, if you visit an elementary school and you visit a first grade class or a kindergarten class, or if you have a two-year-old at home whose second most favorite word is why after no, you know what I mean. In research, we are constantly wondering. It allows us to be young and the excitement uh, that is related to solving problems, learning something new is what I live for. And it's one of the great things about being part of a university community. And I just wanna get across that, of course, there are grants, there are awards, so on and so forth. We want to inspire our students. We increase the body of knowledge, but what makes it all fun, and I, and I think most of, uh, uh, most of the colleagues here would agree with me, is that we entered our careers in science because it was fun. And, uh, and so with that, let me start. And let me tell you, I intend to have a very good time for the next 15 to 20 minutes. As you can see, I'm all UVA. I've got my UVA Hawaiian shirt. And so in the spirit of having fun, I'd like to answer this question. What do I do at the University of Virginia? And I hope this is a, this, that some of my answers will come as a bit of a surprise. So I borrowed from the internet uh, this cartoon. Maybe many of you have seen it, circulated quite widely in social media, for example. And what this cartoon represents uh, is, are some very bad stereotypes. It's the spectrum of research across the sciences from left to right, arranged by purity. And what you see at the very far right is uh, a little stick figure pointing to everyone else on the left, uh, someone who re resembles uh, a mathematician. And the, and the mathematician says, oh, hey, I didn't see you guys all the way over there. And um, I have to say, it comes as a surprise that I would be asked to give this lecture for fear that I would be that person way out there and so let me say, that's not me. And one thing I would like to say is this is a very, this, this stereotype is incorrect, right? Many of us work in our, our scientific silos and we have our various stereotypes. So one stereotype I wish to destroy today is that mathematicians are, are way out there on the spectrum without worrying about applications to the world in which we live. And that's not true. So the, the, the talk is really a, a collection of various hats that I wear at the University of Virginia in my research. And I won't go into any great detail in with regard to any of these topics. I just sort of want to give you a fun overview of some of the things that I do with, with, my, with my colleagues. Sometimes I'm a mathematical archaeologist. These pictures that you see, there's three of them. There's the, there's the background, which I'll describe briefly later. But the two pictures I'd want to emphasize here that are highlighted, uh, you've probably seen before. These are props from an Indiana Jones film. The Indiana Jones film, um, what is it? The Last Crusade, where Indiana Jones 
uh, partners with his father, played by Sean Connery. And as academics, they are they are they are they're scouring the literature, looking for clues. They they do a lot of archival work. They travel the world and they look for the Holy Grail. And believe it or not, mathematics, which is a very old science, we have a lot of documents that we can draw on. And one thing I want to make very clear is that a mathematician isn't someone who, who primarily works with yellow pads or chalkboards. Sometimes we are mathematical archeologists. To prove a point, here's a photograph uh, uh, of me with some colleagues. About 10 years ago, I took a trip to India and I studied the notebooks of an Indian mathematician by the name of Ramanujan, who I'll tell you about in a moment. Ramanujan left behind three notebooks when he died at the early age of 32, and I have certainly benefited. I'm one of many mathematicians who have benefited from the archival work of literally flipping through yellowed pages of documents, trying to get behind the ideas of brilliant people who preceded us. Some of Ramanujan's formulas have inspired science, engineering, applications that weren't even plausible when Ramanujan lived. Ramanujan died over a hundred years ago. So I'd like to point out that some of this mining that we've done in his notebooks have led to new results on signal processing. This is the engineering and mathematics of how we communicate with satellites, the internet, so on and so forth. They play a very, role, very important role in the organization of objects in space. Think sphere packing. Think how you would rapidly make change if you were a bank. Think about how particles might aggregate in, in theoretical chemistry. These uh, Ramanujan's ideas have played a very important role there. And um, in the world in which we live, we are all nodes in large networks, whether it's the internet or whether it's trying to travel um, from one city to another through a network of, of flights arranged by airlines. There is a mathematics that underlies how one could efficiently assemble mathematician uh, 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 networks. And Ramanujan's ideas play a very central role in that development. And so those three yellowed notebooks, there's only three of them have had a remarkable uh, impact an incredible legacy for Ramanujan's future, our, our era. As Ron mentioned, uh, one of the hats that I wear, which is really quite unexpected, is that because of my role as a mathematical archeologist, I had the opportunity to work on a film uh, called The Man Who Knew Infinity about this man, Ramanujan. This film starred Jeremy Irons as an English professor who you may know by the name of G.H. Hardy. This is the same Hardy of the Hardy-Weinberg law that you know about in, from uh, genetics. And Dev Patel played our Ramanujan. It turns out that because of my work on this film, I now have begun to cultivate other biopics. I can tell you a little bit, uh, I'll just mention two. Uh, together with the Pressman Film Company, we're cultivating a film on Vera Rubin, who was the discoverer of dark matter, tentative, tentatively called uh, dark matter because there's a dark matter of how women in, in her generation could succeed in graduate school as uh, in physics. She wasn't even admitted to many schools when she was studying. And the other film, which might come as a surprise to you that we're cultivating is, uh, is about Phyllis Wheatley, the first published African-American poet. And uh, in, within a year or two, I hope that there will be more that we can report on, uh, but I've gotten a little bit far from what I do in my research. Ramanujan was an amazing man. He was a two-time college dropout who uh, was born in lush South India in the late 19th century. He became infatuated with mathematics and because of his lack of formal training, he didn't know how to record or properly justify his findings. He simply wrote them down in these notebooks. He even said that his findings came to him as visions from a goddess. And so let me just take two or three minutes to share with you the trailer of our film for those who might not know this great story of this great man who inspires so much of my work. What do you see? Sand. Imagine 
If we could look so closely, we could see each grain, each particle. You see, there are patterns in everything. Integrals, infinite series. I've never seen anything like them. From an Indian clerk, ill-educated in Madras, I would very highly value any advice you give me. Letter for you. Postmarked England. Yours truly, S. Ramanujan. What does the S stand for? You can ask him yourself. You intend to invite him here. <laughs> Don't forget me. I could never. Are you Ramanujan by chance? Oh. <laughs> Don't be intimidated. Great knowledge comes from the humblest of origins. For the good of everybody, you should attend some lectures. I'm here to publish. The letter only contained a small sampling of my discoveries. This will take a lifetime. Maybe two. We need proofs of your work. But they are right, sir. I hadn't completed that proof. How do you know? I just do. You don't pull a stunt like that in my class. Now get out! How did you know that theorem? It came to me. These steps you want, I do not know how to do. Where do you think you're going? This is our home. Don't you know what I've given up to be here? I have nothing. You wanted to know how I get my ideas. God speaks to me. There are no proofs. We're just supposed to take him at his word? No, you're to take him at mine. Why do you do it? Because I have to. There are no proofs that can determine the outcome of matters of the heart. We are merely explorers of infinity in the pursuit of absolute perfection. I owe you so much. No, no, no. It's I who owe you. So there you have it. If you haven't seen The Man Who Knew It Infinity, I encourage you to see it streaming on probably your favorite platform and the mathematics is is real and it supports much of my career there are several other answers to the question what do i do at the university of virginia sometimes i'm an applied scientist so as rom mentioned earlier i i work in um in i'm a part-time physicist i have colleagues at caltech and university of chicago we study uh, what is called quantum gravity on the mathematical side of it. And uh, although we haven't solved the pursuit for three-dimensional quantum gravity, we can boast quite nicely uh, this funny fact that our theorem made it onto the Big Bang Theory. So this formula in the back, one of the applications is that we helped uh, supply a formula for a popular television show. More importantly, uh, as Ram mentioned, I proved something called the umbral moonshine conjecture. Uh, this is related to uh, a field of mathematics called representation theory and also appears prominently in string theory. I don't want to go into much detail about what that means, but let me say that this is an artist's rendering uh, of our theorem, where the idea is that there are very special objects called groups. Over here, you see this this, this group, this really little itty bitty thing that looks like a planet that is shedding light on the universe and, and all of these other gadgets below it. Uh, this is a, a guiding principle in research where you seek an oracle, an oracle that reveals answers to the questions that you're trying to answer. As a mathematical sentence, what we prove, uh, me and my colleagues, is that the symmetries of all 24 dimensional spaces are controlled by functions called automorphic forms that I was able to define and I was able to package them in a very nice way. And it's, it's very um, pleasing to see uh, other people beginning to use these functions. Most of the time, I am a pure mathematician. And uh, so I've proven theorems about the Riemann hypothesis. I proved that most of the Riemann hypothesis is true. If, it, if, there, if this famous math problem is false, this problem has a $1 million bounty, uh, I will be very disappointed. But as a pure mathematician, I aim for 
some of these long standing open problems. And from time to time, we're able to whittle away at them and make some small progress. I do want to indicate a theorem that is quite precise rather than just waving my hands. So let me give you one example of a theorem I've proven, uh, which, uh, is, which may seem like child's play. So in number theory, we study numbers. The numbers are the first mathematical objects we ever learn, right? That's what the first things that you teach. You teach kids to count blocks. And the theory, number theory of partitions is the number theory of adding and counting. So if I were to ask you to list all the ways of representing the number four as a sum without worrying about reorderings, you'd find there are only five ways of making the number four. They're listed here, four, three plus one, two plus two, two plus two ones and four ones. There's a function defined by Euler that counts these ways, it's called P. So P of four is five. There's five representations there. So bear with me. If you're ever bored, like in the next two minutes, the number of partitions of eight is 22. The number of ways of making eight, there are 22 of them. Eight would be the first one. Seven plus one would be the second one. Six plus two would be the third one. And by the time you wrote down eight ones that add up to eight, there would be 22 different ways. You might be surprised to know that for 16, there are 231 ways. I don't invite you to try, them, try to write them all down because no matter how many times you try, you'll miss one or maybe you'll duplicate some. You'll, you'll, you'll get like 233 every time. And for 32, there's over 8,000. And for 64, there's over one and a half million ways of representing 64 as a sum. These numbers grow at a crazy rate. But the way I started, you could imagine that this function could have been introduced in Sesame Street. So here I'm having a little bit of fun. Here's the count from Sesame Street. Let's count them all. Ah ha ha. Well, as I've suggested, these numbers grow at such a rapid rate, I'm leading you into the belief that this is not possible. Well, for the longest time, this was considered not possible. And about 10 years ago, Brunier and I, pictured here before the pandemic in front of the rotunda, we proved a theorem that exactly computes each one of these numbers. There were, pre there were procedures previously that led to an answer but that's not the same as a formula. And we found a formula, you just plug in for N, out comes the number, just to prove to you that there is a lot of structure that goes into it. This is the statement of our theorem. I won't explain any of the gadgets, but I'll just tell you the numbers that we are trying to count are here and the rest of these words indicate how we could compute those numbers without literally listing and trying to get and trying to perform the impossible task of counting. There's no need for doing that. The last application I'll, I'd like to give, given that University of Virginia is, uh, epitomizes excellence in academics as well as, and also epitomizes excellence in athletics. I'd like to highlight my friend Todd DeSorbo, who's the coach of the UVA swim team. The, the, the women's team is number one in the country. And I've done some work with the US Olympic team. And now that I'm here, I'm working with Todd and we're doing some pretty intricate data analysis. Uh, and we're trying to make his team fast. So we're doing that. If you just Google names like Kate Douglas or Paige Madden or Alex Walsh, you'll see that uh, in, in many of the events, we have three, four, sometimes even five Virginia swimmers ranked in the top 10 uh, in, in the NCAA ranks. We will have, I almost guarantee it, multiple swimmers on the, going to the Olympics if there is an Olympics in Tokyo. So here is a graph of some of the statistics, statistics we calculate. Here and I'll just tell you, this is super fun. And because of the pandemic, the only reason I've been going to campus is to work uh, this mathematics with the swim team. So in any event, I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. I love it, the University of Virginia. I wear many hats. If, if you'd like to, to work with us 
And if you think maybe we could shed light in, in your research group, like I said, we've only been here a year and a half. We're always looking for new things and uh, look us up. We're in Kirchhoff Hall and hopefully by the fall, uh, we will all be back on campus enjoying our students, the, the beautiful grounds, uh, making the world a better place. All right, thank you. Thank you.